right. Thank you, Skyler. And uh, thank you, Tilo, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, also for joining us. Just a couple of little brief things before uh, Tilo kicks it off here. Um, uh, like to appreciate Tilo for coming to talk to us about it, about um, his book that he co-authored with uh, Jeff Liker, Giving Wings to Her Team, is kind of what he's going to kind of go over. Some things, and we'll talk a little bit more about this after he's done, but Tilo will be at the Katakon 10 um, in um, April, uh, April 9th and 10th um, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And actually he'll be doing several things. He'll be doing a, a pre-summit Kata level set on April 8th and also be doing a, um, a uh, Kata, Kata Dojo and um, uh, co coaching cascade uh, workshop with uh, Gerd Allinger. And we'll talk about that a little bit more afterwards. And he'll be talking about some, some of that in the context of what he's going over today. And that'll be the day after the summit, April 11th. So we hope folks will join us for Katakon 10. Um, so uh, with that, Tilo, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Jim, for having me. And thank you for the introduction. Um, we'll dive right in. And Skylar, just to add to your announcement about the recording link, uh, the slides will also be included because we had these uh, questions last time. So, um, Jim, uh, can you see my slide? Is that good? Are we good to go? Awesome. All right. So, uh, welcome to today's webinar from my side as well. Um, I want to talk about and share with you a set of questions that have changed the way I've been leading my team. Uh, as a plant manager uh, when I used to work for a German power tool company here in uh, Germany. So how are these questions, uh, which we call the coaching kata, uh, connected to what is concerning us as managers and leaders today? Well, I think we're living in very exciting times uh, because so many things are changing. And that has, I think, two major implications. Well, first of all, Continuous improvement and innovation maybe have never been as important as they are now. So adapting, uh, using opportunities uh, that arise and also enabling people, enabling our teams to adapt, to resiliently react to all these changes we have, maybe also has never been as important as it is today. Now, I guess most of you have been on a journey of continuous improvement, uh, maybe a journey of lean, and I don't know how your experiences have been, uh, but my experiences are best summarized with the picture uh, I'm going to show you here. And that is that when we're trying to improve, it feels like um, we're not lacking effort. Uh, so we're trying to push this wheel of continuous improvement uh, up the hill. And of course, uh, when we focus on introducing new methods and tools, um, we, we kind of uh, pushing this wheel up here, uh, create some potential and uh, say, yeah, that's great. We're improving. But unfortunately, um, at that point when we think we got something, often this happens. Uh, just recently, somebody said, well, it could be worse. This little guy could be standing in front of this wheel. Anyways, I don't know how your experiences have been, but um, for me, it felt like this. Um, yes, we're setting targets uh, for improvement, but somehow um, this elephant is kind of walking in the other direction. And the more I, I kind of worked on this, the more I experienced um, I realized that there is two major things in a way, and they, they are kind of invisible. And that's why we probably don't realize them. And uh, number one is that actually when we're trying to improve, we're fighting existing habits. And secondly, uh, so often, although we set targets, uh, they're quickly washed away by the whirlwind of daily business. Now, in 2007, uh, I met Mike Rother, uh, whom probably most of you know from his research uh, at Toyota. And so what did Mike find there? Well, basically, he found two very fascinating things. First, Toyota purposefully develops um, a shared way of thinking, a shared way of approaching challenges 
uh, which we call a more scientific way of thinking. And secondly, and I think that is even more fascinating, they do so through deliberate practice, so not classroom training, deliberate practice on the job, on real projects with managers as coaches. And I really think the second part is kind of the, the secret sauce. Now, why do we talk about scientific thinking and why do I think this um, is so important? Well, because our brain somehow has this natural tendency to look for patterns based on our experience and to match what is kind of what we're confronted with uh, with these existing patterns so basically our, our brain is trying to solve this inverse problem uh, our brain is trapped inside a a, um, a a box or skull and is getting all these signals from the outside and is trying to make sense and somehow the best way to make sense of something new is trying to connect it to what we already know now while this is very efficient it's not such a good approach if things are rapidly changing. And uh, that is why um, practicing a more scientific way of approaching reality might be very helpful in times where things change rapidly. And understanding this kind of was for me a really an aha moment, because what I realized was that in our, in our attempt to develop a, an adaptable organization, a learning organization. We tried so many things, like we tried to implement new methods and tools. And I think that's important, like lean tools, like tools and methods from, from the agile tool set. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, we usually kind of do some organizational change, like reduce hierarchy, move decision-making to the front line. And while I think both of these circles are important to act on, I think we should keep in mind that these are like seeds falling on ground. And the question is, are they falling on fertile ground? And I believe that practicing a more scientific way of thinking is kind of the, the fertile ground or prepares the ground for developing a learning organization. Because in the end, uh, we cannot change the culture by flipping a switch. It's more like setting out on this learning quest, um, having that direction of a learning organization, which in the end ex consists of learning individuals, and then experimenting step by step how we can become that kind of ideal learning organization. Now, basically, if you summarize what Mike found, it's this. It's managers frequently coaching people on the job with the consistent coaching pattern. So a set of coaching questions and actually an underlying coaching model in order to develop and scale or upscale a more scientific way of working, collaborating when we attempt to go towards and strive for challenging targets. Now, you might think, well, why is this so important to have managers practice a consistent coaching pattern. Here's two reasons. So number one, although we set targets, they're quickly washed away in priority through the daily whirlwind of, of every day's work. So developing a coaching cadence where managers on all levels coach their teams for continuous improving, working towards their target on a frequent basis does the following two things. A, it, developing this coaching cadence develops a more scientific way of thinking. And secondly, because it happens frequently, it sets priority. Now, of course, we've been talking about coaching for a long time. And uh, basically, uh, we say managers should be coaches. And I think this is, this is not a matter of, of knowledge. Uh, we, we clearly understand as managers, yes, we should be coaching our teams. Now, I think it's very important to, to understand what type of coaching are we talking about. And of course, there's different kinds of, of coaching models out there and coaching approaches. And I think it's not about right or wrong, but it's more about the purpose. So the coaching kata and the underlying five phase model is a coaching model for a very specific purpose. And I 
from my perspective, what makes it so special and what really got me intrigued about this way, this approach of coaching is that it has a dual purpose. So in a way you could say any coaching approach, no matter if it's business coaching, career coaching, sports coaching, even, even relationship counseling has the purpose of helping an individual or a team to solve a problem or reach a goal. So now this coaching kind of coaching model does that too. So the first purpose is to help a team to help an individual to reach a challenging goal or solve a problem. Now, while that is common to all coaching approaches, the coaching kind of has a second purpose. And that is while the person or team is working to reach a specific goal to through the way we coach develop a more scientific way of thinking, which will help the person or team we're coaching to achieve even more challenging goals in the future. Now, I don't want to go into the details of the coaching kata questions here, but you might wonder, practicing these questions, these coaching kata questions here, like target condition, action condition, obstacles, next step, and how quickly can we go and see, is that really going to help me to become a better coach? Now, the interesting part here is that the word kata has two meanings. So the first meaning is a practice routine. So basically it's a recipe how to get started with this dual purpose coaching approach. The second meaning is a way of doing. Now what will happen is this. If you try these questions and start practicing them, at first they will only be a starter recipe. And, and your brain will probably go like, ah, oh, this is rote, this, this is robotic. You really want me to read these questions? Well, if you keep going, over time, some magic will happen. So if you keep practicing these questions, at first your brain will, will just read these questions. But then over time, your brain automatically, through practice, will turn these questions into a five-phase coaching model. Now, why do I think this is so important to have. Well, before I answer that, let me first, let's first jump into a everyday situation here. So imagine you're in a meeting. Um, this could be a daily huddle, stand up, shuffle meeting, uh, and your team standing around the table is reporting uh, on their KPIs. You can see the KPIs here in the back. So they're, they're reporting maybe on some deviation, and then taking turns and explaining what they're going to do as a countermeasure. Now imagine um, after um, everybody has spoken, uh, this guy here speaks up and says, uh, he has some deviation and says, but no worries, boss, I got this. I will train my team to execute the process correctly. And you think, oh, come on, you told me the same thing last week and we have the problem again. Now, don't say it. Uh, count to three, and the question is, what could you do, rather than telling, to use a bit more coaching approach? Now, you don't know if this person is right or wrong. I mean, training, training the team might be the right countermeasure here. It's just your gut is giving you the feeling like, ah, this might be not solving the problem. Now, rather than asking a question like, do you think this is the right thing to do now? Well, what, what will he say? Of course, boss, you don't trust me? It's a trust question. Uh, or saying, well, well um, I'm not sure. You might want to check this. You know, I'm sure. I've been working here for 30 years. You don't believe me? So imagine you had practiced the coaching kata and had this five-phase model in mind. So what you could do if your gut gives you the feeling we shouldn't go there. At first, rather than jumping in, you could ask yourself, mentally this person here where's he at which phase is he in so take a look which phase is this person in talking about target actual obstacle next step or due date what do you think i guess um, you agree that probably this person is explaining what they want to do next that's a very common pattern 
if if we're under pressure, if a problem arises, we, we, we jump to action, the action bias. Now, when you realize that, what you could do is you could go back one phase. So you could pull the conversation back to the obstacle phase by simply asking question three of the coaching kata. So, hey, by training the team, which obstacle exactly are you addressing? Or in other words, which obstacle are you addressing? Which problem are you trying to solve with this step? And then you'll see if there's a logic connection, fine, then you can do it. If not, you might say something like, hey, don't worry if you don't know exactly, but maybe before we jump to action, let's find out, let's go and see. So this is just one example. And it's actually one of the situations we practice in, in the coaching dojo, the flight simulator for coaches, how to react in a meeting situation when you have the feeling your team is jumping to quick and maybe prematurely uh, jumping to, to countermeasures. Now, why do I think this is on a, on a bigger picture is even more important? Well, recently somebody shared the following two by two matrix. Uh, like on the x-axis you have uh, no, don't know, um, and when you look on that from a management, management role perspective, you could say, uh, does the manager know about the topic, the content, the technical topic we're talking about, or does he or she doesn't know? And then on the y-axis you have like the options, how to react uh, to a given situation uh, with your with your direct report or with your team so you could tell or you cannot tell now there's a there's um a couple of fields here that are very clear like if we don't know um and tell that might frustrate the team and might go terribly wrong um if we know uh sure we can tell but that might pull the initiative and kind of um, like the motivation from the team um if we know and don't tell well we might want to do that, but um, then again, we're, 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 we're not doing anything at all. We know, but we don't tell. Now, what I think is that what's really happening in the world is that we're more and more moving from bottom left, so leaders know and can tell and do so, to the top right, which is, well, we don't know, and therefore we know we shouldn't tell. And you know what? It's not only us as leaders that are here, um, our teams are there too. So then what can we do? Well, basically we should coach, but not just for any kind of coaching approach, we should coach for a more scientific way of thinking and, and kind of to bring that back, I uh, use a coaching approach that not only develops a more scientific way of thinking, but through developing a coaching cascade puts priority on moving forward towards our target. Now, and basically this is a short summary of what we've experienced in the past years. And just to come back to my initial picture, that fertile ground, developing a learning organization is not a flip the switch project. It's a path of learning to coach your team as a leader. And um, that is what Jeff and, and myself uh, have shared in the book, Jim, you mentioned, um, which basically is about a young leader. It's written in a novel style uh, and a young leader uh, trying and learning to coach her team so she can give wings to her team in developing and exploring this unknown zone uh, through as more scientific way of working towards uh, our target. And um, we believe that people can reach the unexpected and outperform what expected through better coaching. And we also believe that your key team can do it too. They need you as a coach, helping them to practice and work forward in a more scientific way of exploring. And uh, with that, Jim, back to you. Um, I haven't checked the chat yet. Maybe we have um, some questions uh, already coming up or uh, there's something uh, that's on your mind, uh, Jim. Yeah, actually, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tilo. That was excellent. Um, yeah, we have had some questions that came up. 
And hey, Skylar, just a message out to you. It's not letting me bring up my video. Um, so if you can, you can do that. But um, one question came up is uh, somebody's asking, um, you know, why do we need coaching to get improvements? You know, people have been doing improvements, continuous improvement, ties in and other things for many years. Why, what, what, what does coaching do to help in that regard? Yeah, so for, for me personally, there's, there's two, two main reasons. So uh, one is if you think about solutions you've tried to implement in the past, and although they might be, you know, good solutions, how sustainable are they? And very often we fall back because we actually implemented our own way of thinking rather than involving the team in developing their solutions. And, you know, there, there's no solution that's more sustainable than the solution that has been developed by the people that are working in the process. So then, then of course, we've been talking about involving people for a long time. Now, what I learned is if you, if you want pe people to be involved, you have to give them self-control. So motivation, self-motivation, self-control are directly linked. Now, if you, if you, if you aspire to do that, uh, you cannot just go laissez-faire and say, hey, um, up to you, you do whatever you like, uh, because we have targets. We're, we're not doing improvement for improvement's sake. We're doing improvement to reach breakthrough goals and targets. So how can you kind of get that together, like self-control, reaching targets, self-control, reaching targets. And in my experience, the best way we can do is enable people to come up with their own solutions in a scientific way. And that is uh, what happens through coaching. Now, the second reason is a very personal reason, uh, which I experienced myself as a leader. And that is, there is this pressure of you having all the answers always. Well, we don't have the answers as well. So coaching kind of frees you from that pressure of always having to have the answer. Okay, good. Um, we've had some other questions come up. One asked, um, how, 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 how do you embed the uh, PDCA cycle into the codified questions? Oh, okay, cool question, awesome. So um, basically P PDCA describes a, 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 if it's done rapidly, describes a way of exploring through the unknown f zone, okay? Um, now, the five questions are kind of the, the, the other side of that medal. That is what the leader can do to help their team to kind of follow a paid PDCA approach. So to work in a scientific way. And I think that is something we've been overlooking. Like if you think of um, either PDCA problem solving, there's forums like PDCA forums. Um, we've done PDCA training. Uh, we have the A3, for example, okay, so, uh, things like that. So these are all forums that are aimed at helping people to structure their problem solving process. And I think what we've been overlooking is that these forms, while they give a certain structure, do not develop a scientific way of thinking. They don't change mindset. And that is where the coach comes in. So it's, it's a perfect fit. So if you say, hey, I want my team to work forward in a PDCA way, I use the five questions to coach them on that way. And, and Jeff, Jeff Liker just mentioned recently when we, when, oh, actually, when we talked about the book recently, he, he just re-stated re, um, again that at Toyota, what he's seen is that there's never the tool, like an A3, without the coach. Because the tool gives the structure, but the coach brings the thinking. And I think that is, uh, that is how, it, how it matches. So, uh, Kamis, awesome question. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, I know. One thing I've noticed when talking with you, Jeffrey, Mike, and other people that are practicing, it's almost like we look at the improvement kata and the coaching kata, and they're just different manifestations of plan, do, check, act, since they're all manifestations of scientific thinking. So it's just how, you know, different... You use it a little bit differently depending on what your purpose is. Mm. Yeah. So another question came in and it says, how, uh, how do you continue, continue, um, how do you continue with this, uh, awesome, with this awesome toll in an organization where you, we have, uh, been permanent for two or three years and then you are trying to move towards another position. I think what he's trying to ask is, uh, 
you've been making some progress, but you're moving in another position. How do you how do you pull this along um, in regards to continuing with the the you know? Oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I like the question. So, so this is this is something, of course, that has them. Um, bothered me as well like it's not only you move on like your people move on new people come in now um we're running a bit off time but but just quickly here's a couple of things say a um it's a learning journey so first of all think of yourself as a coach for example you are learning to coach and the awesome part is um this is not an an a, a finite end it's, it's like, it's really a lifelong learning journey. How can you coach in even more difficult situations when the heat is on? So no matter what position you're in, you're taking your coaching skills along with you, okay? Um, secondly, uh, your people, the people you've been coaching will move on and that will spread scientific thinking in the organization. Awesome, so we now we have more scientific thinkers. Or you're in a new position uh, for a different team, a different location, and now you're going, going back to, um, you know, you, you maybe need some, some support from your previous team, and you know they're working the scientific way because you've coached them. Awesome, okay? And um, some of the young folks um, I worked with during my time at, at Festool as a plan manager are now in other companies, and I can see what they're doing, and they're doing it there. So, Hey, it, it's it, developing a learning organization is a marathon, not a sprint. And you're taking your skill with you and, and you're helping others to grow and take it with them. So uh, that's, that's my quick answer to that question. Yeah. And, and by the way, here's another one. Um, what, is really, what really also fascinates me about the improvement kata and coaching kata, um, although uh, we've been talking about coaching and you know structured scientific thinking for a while, um, Coaching kata, improvement kata, will make it very specific. These recipes are very good. Like it's like a minimum viable intervention. It's not a big program. It's a minimum viable intervention in the organization. So it's quick to kind of, you know, get a new person involved. And that's helpful too. Um, I just recently saw a book. It said like uh, 200 um, effective coaching questions. And you go like, yeah, um, sure. I'm going to remember them uh, when, when I'm pressured. Yeah, sure. So <laughs> we're talking about five phases. Um, we always say five questions because that was the original set, but it's, it's more like eight or nine questions. Um, but that, that's, that's a set you can use and you can get started with. It's like a minimum viable intervention for the beginning. And I think that also helps, although you're moving through the organization, you can always, you know, drip, drip, drip. Yeah. And the drop uh, makes the the, the hole in the stone, uh, you just keep going. Hence, hence the emphasis on practice, practice, practice. The more you do that, the better you get uh, yes. and more confidence you get. Well, I know we're getting close. One more question, then we'll kind of wrap it up. Somebody's got a question. Um, uh, Susan asks, with a uh, continual improvement mindset, she still struggles with the measurable and repeatable metrics. Um, any suggestion uh, specifically for increasing the effectiveness of the communication. Okay, so hmm. I might understand the question wrong here, so I'm, I'm making assumptions. Um, so Susan, correct me if I'm wrong here. So what I'm, it seems like you're thinking about how to measure improvement of effective communication. Uh, please, please quickly chat if, if I'm wrong here. So correct. Um, yes, you said correct. Okay, cool. So basically, we're talking about behavior and language. Now, the first obstacle I always find is, well, if I want to measure that, I have to see it, I have to recognize it, and I have to kind of see patterns in a repetitive way. So basically, thinking about language and behavior, uh, you, could, you, you could think about frequent interactions, like you, you don't want to look or measure that in general, but you could say, hey, we have these, you know, level meetings, daily, weekly, whatever, and that's where I'm going to look. And then first you could describe uh, how are people behaving today? What language do I hear? So, um, for example, if you say I want to develop a more scientific way of thinking, um, you say, okay, so how do I know we're not thinking and working like this right now? Well, in a meeting, you would hear things like this, uh, we have to do this, or 
for sure this is right. We've been always doing it like this. I'm going black and white here. It, it might be more subtle, but these are these would be things you're looking for. Or you would look like the discussion is rapidly like, like narrowing on only one solution. Okay. So now then you would say, hey, if we are getting better in scientific thinking, I would hear more things like, hmm, interesting idea. How can we test it? Or, hmm, interesting. Seems like we have to dig a bit deeper, go and see and understand what is really happening here. It might have changed. So also uh, you might hear things like, cool, we learned something new. Okay, this is, this is diff awesome. So um, you might, if you want to measure that, describe before and after of behavior and language in a specific interaction that frequently occurs, like a, a, a standard repetitive meeting you have. And that might be a first approach that you can get started with. Behavior, language, before and after in an interaction that happens frequently. Okay, great. One, one more question. Hopefully quick question, just because somebody asked this, and I actually I think it's important. A lot of people run into this. How would you get started in an organization where top management isn't supportive of this type of thinking? Any suggestions? Yeah, get started. <laughs> <laughs> start anyway. <laughs> start anyway. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll share a personal story here. Now, um, I started this when I first was a production manager, then moved on to be plant manager. Now, if you're a plant manager, um, you don't get coached, okay? You deliver numbers. If the numbers are good, you can do whatever, you, well, you can do more what you like. If the numbers are not good, handcuffs, okay? So that, that gave me a lot of kind of, you know, unease. I said, okay, so I know how I want to work with my team, uh, but I'm not experiencing the same for myself. Um, and then, yeah, that was kind of something that was bothering me. And then um, we did um, uh, like biannual or, or twice a year, we did a 360 degree feedback. And one of my young department managers uh, at one point gave me the feedback, hey, Tilo, in the last two, in the last kind of four, four, six weeks, I realized you got a lot calmer. And I was like, oh, cool, yeah. And I, I was like thinking, I was thinking, well, what is he talking about? So I went home, thought about it. And then I realized something. I said, ah, it wasn't so clear for me. But then looking back after he said that, I realized I had made a decision. And the decision was, well, I cannot change the world. The world is like it is waiting for top managers to change. Might take a long time, but I definitely know how I want my team to work, how I want to work with my team. And I know what kind of leadership, culture, and climate we want to create in the plant. I went to my team and said, hey, you know what? I'm going to buffer that. I'm going to try to keep all the cruise missiles out of the plant as good as I can. Some might come through. We'll just, you know, bite our teeth and <laughs> just do it. But besides that, we're always free to choose how we lead our team. And I think this, for me, this thinking about a coaching approach, this is what it all comes down to, this question, how do you want to lead your team, no matter what the world looks like? So, of course, it would be cool if top management is, would be involved. But would I wait for it? No. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for their questions. So to wrap up here, um, Tilo, what will you and Gerd uh, be sharing with this Katakan 10? Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, let me bring that up here. So um, <laughs> it's basically the two books, but okay, let's let's sum let's summarize that. Yeah, so your, your little visual. Aid. So there's 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 two questions that um, I just briefly mentioned today, but they're linked to what I shared. So number one is well, if we say we want managers as coaches, or if we personally say, hey, how can I become a better coach for my team? The issue is that this is not a knowledge problem. We don't need another book or you know classroom instruction about coaching. The issue is, although I know I should be coaching, when the pressure is on, the person steps in my room, boss, I have a problem. I have like 21, 22, 23 to make a decision, coach, or tell, and if I want to coach, I need to know what to do now. So it basically has to be intuitive. 
And when you look to any area where there is professional skill de development, so not knowledge, reading books, skill development, you will find a training setting, a safe space where you can practice. Like you could go, you could look at athletes, they go to the gym. You could look at surgeons, they practice before they do heart surgery. You don't study heart surgery and they say, okay, try yourself out. Uh, you could look at pilots, uh, even if they have 10,000 hours of flight, they still go through the flight simulator, right? So where do managers go? And, and you know, anybody responsible for leading and, and working with people, where do we go to practice coaching skills? So this is what we call the Cata Coaching Dojo. It's basically a safe space that provides role play setting, just like the meeting you saw, where we can practice coaching so it gets intuitive. So this is number one, how to create good coaches. Number two, and that is what Gert's book is about, and that is how do you now create this cascade so it scales, upscales in the organization and it creates this, you know, constant heartbeat of improvement, setting the priority so we can fight the whirlwind. Okay, so scientific thinking, habit, change, and then this, this fight the whirlwind through the, the coaching cascade and actually um jim uh, this is the first time in the u.s that these two yeah. things like the, the coach development dojo and this how do you set up such a cascade linked to your hoshin process how do you kind of do that in an organization so garrett and i am going to do that for the first time at, at catacon and um <laughs> that's so cool i'm really looking forward to to running this uh, thing with Gerd. Excellent. We are and together. Yeah, and I worked worked together for a long time at Festival, so we know each other really well. Yeah. And it's basically the summary of our uh, experience here. And we're going to bring that together in a workshop day. Yeah, and, and we're def definitely looking forward to it. So, so yeah. So if you want to meet Tilo and Gerd, learn from Tilo and Gerd, and all the other Kata geeks that are there, come to KataCon 10 April in Indianapolis. You can find more information out at uh, leanfrontiers.com, our website. And you can register for this uh, Katacon. You can register for Tilo and Garrett's workshop. We hope to see you there. And like I said, it's not only a lot of learning that goes on at Katacon, but there's a lot of fun that goes on as well. And you meet all kinds of wonderful people. So again, thank you everybody for joining in. Thank you, Garrett, um, for Garrett, Tilo, for sharing with us. And we look forward to seeing everybody here in just a couple months. So. With that, Skylar and Tilo, I think we will finish. So thank you very much, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Jim, for having me today.